Hi, now for something completely different. No, this is not a new tone chime. This is a Rittenhouse chime. I was contacted by the owner of this chime and they had seen some of my other chime videos, both new tone and a couple Rittenhouse chimes. They said they had a problem with their chime and it hadn't worked properly in a long time and would I consider looking at it? And I told them I would. There are some limitations that I explained to them. One of the limitations on something like this is I don't have any spare parts for these. I don't have tubs of extra Rittenhouse chime bases that I can rob things out of. And so it had to be complete. And for the most part it is. It does seem to be missing a couple, three of the adjustable tube hangers here. But I think that's something that a solution for isn't too terribly difficult. It's really the rest of it that has to be complete. The solenoids, the plungers, the Telecron gear drive and motor assembly and so forth because I don't have any parts for these. While I have repaired this one and it does work correctly, this is not a step-by-step -step repair video because those take a lot of time to, to make and record and I don't have time for that right now. Uh, we're very busy and I have lots of things to repair. So this is more of an overview of this type of chime. Now the owners of this chime said this is a 1940s chime. And I believe that they mentioned that the house was built in like 1947 or 1948. So it was a post-war chime. And that's probably about right. I don't know what model it is. There's no model on this. I did find a couple images that are similar to this on Google, but not a real model number. So I don't know what model it really is. I would say based on its general overall construction, it's probably late 40s through early or mid 50s would be my guess. And it's a very interesting design. It's very well made. It's very large. It's much larger than a Newtone chime base. It's probably 50% bigger and it's very heavy. It's a very heavy steel chassis and it's an interest, has some interesting design aspects. So I'm just going to briefly go over what I found, show you a few things in case you have one of these and it's something that's not working correctly. Maybe you can spruce it up and get it to work again. The heart of any chime like this is, of course, the Telecron motor gear drive assembly. And this was made by the Telecron company in Ashland, Massachusetts, just like they all were. It's a model. 462M1386. It's a type B3. It is a 16 volt motor, not a 20 volt motor like Newtone used, and it is a 6 RPM motor. The gear drive assembly, this part right here, it's a little larger than what Newtone used around the same time. So the, I think this is a little beefier of a unit, perhaps. In fact, everything about this chime is larger, heavier, beefier than Newtone chimes are. Not that that's necessarily better, it's just different. What you have here underneath the black box, which nicely slides off, which makes servicing easy, you have the this drum assembly and a bunch of switches behind it, and that's what causes the chime when it rings to sequence the solenoids in the correct order. Here's a close-up of the data plate on the Telecron motor assembly. It's got the type, the model number, a serial number, 16 volts, 60 cycle, runs at 4 watts, and the RPMs are up here in the corner. This is partially covered up by the big screws that hold the motor assembly together. And here's a close-up of the drum assembly. This is a very interesting design. This aluminum drum is attached to the output shaft of the gear drive assembly. So when the motor runs, it turns the drum. And then on the drum, there are these little punched out slots here. There are eight of them all together because it is an eight note chime. What happens is as the drum rotates and it turns what would be, it depends on which end you look at it, but I think it would be counterclockwise. As it turns, the little raised nubs or louvers or whatever you want to call them, they bump up against these switch assemblies and that's what causes the solenoids to be energized. Now you'll notice that there are five switches, but it's a four solenoid chime. This last one down here, which I would call number one because it's the primary one, this is basically your on off switch. And in this raised edge of the drum here, and you'll see it as it rotates, there's a notch in it. And when the motor 
causes the drum to turn. It turns past the notch, so the raised edge pushes against the switch to hold it closed, and that's what allows the motor to keep running once the visitor has taken their finger off the button. As the drum turns, then each of the nubs push against the, the front side of the switch. It's the two-part switch, so you have the front contacts here and the rear contacts on the other side, and it pushes against them, causes them to close, and that's what causes the solenoids to become energized. The spacing of the nubs has to be correct for it to ring in the right sequence and also with the right tempo. How fast the chimes ring is based on the spacing of the nubs and also the speed of the motor. I would suppose that this was an interesting design because by changing the drum, you could easily create different chimes that would ring in different orders or different paces or different number of tubes. So you don't have to redo the whole drive assembly design. You could simply change the drum. The drum, basically, it's like an analog program where the, the slots are regulate what it sounds like. This is very much like those little wind-up music boxes that you have when you're a kid and you, you wind it up and it's got the drum with the little pins on it and it twangs the little tone making metal strips and it plays a song. So it's sort of along that kind of idea. The connections are easy. We have terminal strip here with five different connections. We also have a variable rheostat here, which is what would be considered to be the volume adjustment of the, of the chime. There's a movable tab right here and you can push it back and rock it right and left. When it's towards the right, the solenoids hit softer. When it's to the left, they hit harder. So you can adjust how hard and how or how loud the chime rings. You can also adjust it by moving the tubes in and out. And that's so how you have multiple adjustments to do that. Here's the terminal strip. It's nicely labeled. We have trans for transformer. So we have T1 and T2. This is where constant power from your low voltage transformer is connected. And then you have 1A, 1B, and 8. So this is like side door, rear door, main door for an eight note ring. And the way the wiring would be hooked up, you have two wires that come from each button. One of those wires from each button will go under T1 along with the transformer wire. And then the other one, if you want an eight note chime, the wire goes here. If it's a front or, or a rear or side door button, then you hook it up to the appropriate terminals here. These have these nice knurled nuts on them. So, it's easy to finger tighten them down when you put the wires under there. No wrench or screwdriver required. Uh, these are very much like the terminals that are on Lionel transformers um, from the 50s and 60s, and that sort of helps date it. As for the solenoids, you have a very interesting arrangement here. You have these two 90 degree metal brackets that are screwed to the base. And each one has two solenoids in it. And the solenoids are pointed 45 degrees apart. And this looks very odd, but when you hang tubes on it, the tubes just hang straight, so you wouldn't really know. This is not at all a compact design. This actually takes up a fair amount of room. You have these threaded standoffs here, and then you have threaded rods that come out of each one. And they're supposed to be in a, a large, diameter adjustable tube hanger on each one. Uh, it only showed up here with one, so either the owners have the other three or they're missing. Not too terribly difficult to replace. I don't know if you could actually find any of these currently available in brand new ones, but what you simply could do if you needed to was you could get two standard threaded nuts and you could put one nut on, hang the, the cord for the tube on the threaded part and then put another one and then just move them back and forth as need be. It's not quite as elegant, but it certainly would work out. On the back of the chime, you have this large metal plate. There isn't much else on the back of the chime. And I'm gonna take this off to show you because this is how you gain access to the plungers in the solenoids. Uh, everything on this chime are machine screws and some of them are steel and some of them are brass. So it's a nice attention to detail back in the days when things were made well. If we take the cover off, what you see on the back side of the cover are these sort of orange 
felt pads. And the felt pads, if you look, you can see indentations in each one where they've pressed up against the ends of the solenoid tubes, one, two, three, and four. And that is what holds the plungers in the solenoids and also acts as a noise cushion so when the spring shoots it back after it shuts off, it doesn't go clank against the metal. It just goes up against the felt so you don't hear it. I'm gonna go ahead and take one plunger out because these are rather interesting. And here's one of the plungers out of one of the solenoids. It's an interesting design. This plunger is about 50% larger in diameter and not quite in length than a Newtone plunger from the same period. And this is the type of design where the spring is in the front of the plunger. So I'm gonna go ahead and slide this off carefully. And these are, these are tapered conical springs. So this end is a larger diameter. This is the end that sits in the front of the solenoid bore. This is would be closest to the tube, which would be here. And then a smaller diameter here. And so it gets progressively smaller as you go down the coils. And the small end just simply slides over the end of the plunger assembly here. Then it goes into the solenoid board to hold it in place. So it's an easy solution. No groove in, in the tip or anything like that to hold it in place. It's just simply a press, it's not even a press fit, it's just a slip fit. Now the plunger, very large, very heavy. And yes, it does look like it's made out of copper, but it's not. And we'll do the magnet test here as we've done before. And you can see it is a ferrous piece of material. So I'm pretty sure it's probably a steel plunger and it has maybe a copper coating on it or something like that. When I took all of these apart to clean them, they were all gummy, just like they always are in all chimes. And so I cleaned them up and when I was done, we had a nice shiny copper finish and a lot of copper residue on the 1200 grit sandpaper. So I cleaned them up carefully. They're big, they're heavy, they're beefy. And on the ends, you have, instead of plastic tips, you have the remaining some sort of, perhaps it's some kind of, it's not cloth, it could be, it's probably some type of leather or something like that. I'm not sure exactly. I'm sure they're worn to some degree. I don't know how large they would have been, how thick they would have been when they were brand new, but this is what they are today. With a leather tip you get a softer sort of tone as it hits the tubes than you do with a wooden tip or a plastic tip or something like that. The earliest Newtone chimes used a very similar design. So to reassemble this you simply slip the spring, the small end of the spring, down over the tip being very careful not to mangle it and also not to have it go sprawling across the shop where you'll never find it because as I said in the beginning, I don't have any extra ones. This is all there are. It's not a bad design. It's easy enough to do. Although one of the downsides to spring designs like this is they're not at all universal in any way whatsoever. So if you lose it, you're out of luck. So this is the solenoid bore that it goes back into. These have been thoroughly cleaned. These are just a larger diameter brass bore, just like you would expect. Everything's been cleaned. Yes, I use lighter fluid. I didn't use WD-40 or any things like that. Only lighter fluid, same as on a Newton chime. And when you go to reinstall this, you just simply put the spring in the opening. And if you did a good job cleaning when you let go of it, it should bounce up and down a couple times to show that it moves freely inside. Once you do that, then all you have to do is put the metal plate back in place and it's good to go. What was wrong with our little Rittenhouse chime? I guess it's not so little, it's kind of big actually. So what was wrong with our Rittenhouse chime? The primary thing that was wrong with it, like most older chimes, everything was hugely dirty. All of the plungers and solenoid assemblies, all gummy and sticky and no good at all. The motor assembly cleaned all of that up. The motor actually runs well. The gear drive assembly is very quiet and that doesn't seem to be much of a problem. The revolving drum, this was coated with a fairly thick 
coating of hardened grease and junk on it, which doesn't help it at all. So that was taken off and I cleaned it carefully, used a little bit of bronze wool on it to clean off all the gunk and got it back down to its original finish. The largest problem with this has to do with the switch contacts that the drum closes to make it ring properly. There's a couple other little things. So one of the things I noticed when I was playing around and adjusting it is the drum assembly, which is attached to the output shaft of the gear drive assembly, it actually has play. And you can probably see it wiggle. And it also has a little end play where it will, you can pull it in and out. The end play is not that much of an issue, but the this play is probably not great. And I don't think that that's the way it would have been done when it was new. I think it would have been more held in place. It wouldn't have that amount of play. And the problem with this can be, I think, that since the play is, the, the amount of play is greater as you move towards the end, as it rotates, you're not getting the pushing force of the little tabs on the switches evenly, and that creates some problem. The other thing which I think is, this is made out of aluminum. Again, we can do our magnet test to show you that. That's the end piece. The end piece is ferrous, but this end, the drum, is aluminum. Inside, you can see the drum is that long, but inside of it, there's a steel piece also. So that's why the magnet just sticks at this end a little bit, because the magnet's strong enough to get the magnetic force through the aluminum. But on the end here, it doesn't stick. I think the little punched out tabs have worn down some. The surface of them have worn down. So essentially, they're not sticking out as far as they would have when it was brand new. And then the other problem was with the copper strips that make up the switches. So I've removed the drum, which sits on the output shaft right here, so you can see the switches better. So again, there are five switches. This would be switch number one. This is the one that when the drum revolves, the notch in the drum which you can see right here, especially if this would focus better. So here's the notch. This would be the start-stop notch. So when it stops and it's waiting to be rung, this notch lines up with the switch right here and the part that protrudes out. And then when someone pushes the button and the drum begins to turn, it turns on to the raised edge, which then pushes against the switch and holds it closed for the entire cycle. Then the little tabs on the drum individually one at a time push against each switch in the correct order to make it ring the correct song. So the biggest problem with the switch assembly was, first of all, it was hugely dirty. It was all greasy and, and had a lot of hardened grease on it, which I cleaned off and I cleaned all the copper. And then I cleaned the little contacts on each side of each switch so now so they were cleaned and I cleaned off all of the hardened grease and crud that was on them so they would make a good electrical contact but then the other problem with them was the copper these are all copper and they each have this little bump in them and the bump is the part that the tabs on the drums push up against. So the tabs on the drum I think are worn a little bit and there were wear spots in the copper bumps on the switches. Those two things added together made it so that the switches didn't close enough. They didn't they weren't pushed enough to close properly, and even when they did, they weren't pushed hard enough to make sure that you got a really good electrical connection because you need it to push together firmly to do that. Now, I know everyone's inclination on something like that would be, oh, you can just bend them, but no, you can't. That would be the wrong thing to do. When you start bending things, one, it's very imprecise, and two, once you bend it, you can't really make it go back to what it was when it was new. It always will have been bent. 
and you start playing around with that and you get yourself in trouble. So I fell back on something that I do on Newtone chimes sometimes, which is you can't do anything with the drum. The aluminum is too heavy and there isn't any way that you can, I know that some people would think, well, you could get some kind of setup and you could get some kind of little tool and you could like drive it into the little slot under the tab and then bend it up a little bit. No, that's all a very, very, very bad idea because if you damage this, this is like the brain of the chime. These little bumps are a program. It's an analog program that makes it ring at the right pace, the right order and so forth you wreck this and you don't have replacements for it you're out of luck you're never 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 going to be able to make it fixed so that's not something you want to mess around with this on the other hand there's an easy what i think is an easy fix what i wanted to do was i wanted to reverse the wear in the copper bumps on each switch to get them back to what their original level was when they were new and since they're copper, and copper solders really easily, I simply cleaned the copper switches, and then I built up little blobs, because that's basically what they are, little blobs of solder on the peak of each bump. And this way, it restored the height of each bump to back what it was when it was new. In fact, each one probably is just very slightly higher than it was when it was brand new, can't really tell, don't really know for certain, but in the end, what really matters is that it works right. So I built each one of these up and then put it together and tried it. And then number um, three here was the problem child because it had a hard time making a proper connection every single time. So I added a little more and added a little more. And the nice thing about doing it this way is adding a little more solder, very easy to do, especially if you have a proper soldering iron. Also completely reversible. You could simply use a little solder wick and you could take all the solder off and you've got an original just like it was when I got it. It's not a permanent alteration and we haven't bent anything. Don't bend things because you'll break them, you'll mangle it, and then you'll never get it the way it's supposed to be. So I did all of that, put it all back together, played around with it a little bit, and got it to work. And here's the long view. I put the drum assembly back on. And if you look carefully down the spacing between the contacts on the each of the five switches, you'll see the gaps are pretty much even. I did not use a feeler gauge. This is very much like setting, if you had an old car where you just have to put points in your distributor and you have to use a feeler gauge to set the gap on it properly until you had enough money to buy a dwell meter, which made life a lot easier. This is pretty much what you want. One of the things I know about all chimes that I've ever worked on is the more uniform you get everything, the better it works. And these are all very, very close to being uni a nice uniform gap. That's what makes it ring reliably. So I've got power hooked up to it and I'm gonna activate it. And what you wanna watch for is the drum's gonna rotate. And as it rotates, switch number one is gonna be held closed. And then each time a tab hits another switch, the solenoid will be energized. And if you listen really carefully, and I'm gonna to try to be really quiet, you might hear the solenoids actually activating as they are energized. So here we go. Pretty cool, huh? So we'll do it one more time. Just like that, pretty pretty sweet. It's a nice design. Yeah, if it's taken care of, I don't see any reason why it virtually wouldn't last forever. One of the things to be that's important, I think, is when you put the drum back on the motor shaft, you need to make sure that, because there's a certain amount of play in it, as I showed you before, but also where you seat it onto the motor shaft depends on where you seat it and where you tighten it down. What you want is you want this raised groove for switch number one to be exactly in the center of the width of the switch, which then makes each tab in the center of its switch assembly. So it's not running on the edge of the switch, it's hitting the middle of the switch. That's an overview of our late 40s, probably through mid 50s Rittenhouse 
eight note long tube chime bass. If you have one of these and you know what the model number is, put it down in the comments down below because I really couldn't figure out. There isn't nearly as much information about Rittenhouse chimes as there are Newtone chimes, so it's a little uh, tough to tell. It's a very nice chime. It's a very well-made chime. It's a nice heavy-duty chime like they used to make back in those days, and it seems to work really well. I think if you have one of these and it's not working well or at all, I think it should be relatively easy to service. Again, you, there's no spare parts for them, so so, you know, it's like all vintage chimes, things like plungers, springs in particular, the little switching contacts, eh, probably if you had a broken one, you probably could figure out a way to fix it. But all in all, it's a pretty nice chime. I hope you found this interesting and maybe for someone it will be helpful. If it is, give it a thumbs up on YouTube because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell, and when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.